Greetings and welcome to The Movement with Kemet Shockley and Kofi Lenniles. Thank you for joining us. This show highlights the most important voices in the current black movement for social justice. This is a chance for us to learn from the most insightful and impactful leaders in the community. Today we're here with Dr. Malefi Asante, deep thinker, author of over 90 books, and world-renowned professor of Africology at Temple University. Dr. Asante is known for being the pioneering scholar and thinker who gave the term Afrocentricity its substance. Dr. Asante, welcome to the movement. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be on the movement. Dr. Asante, I want to start off with two questions. Question number one, what is Afrocentricity? And number two, what do you want the world to know about black people? For the first question, uh, it is rather simple. Uh, Afrocentricity uh, is a theoretical idea that uh, suggests that African people uh, must view the world from the standpoint of Africans being subjects of our own historical narratives. Uh, in fact, uh, we must understand that uh, uh, we have been marginalized, we have been put on the periphery of Europe uh, for most of the time that we have been in, uh, in the encounter with the West. So part of Afrocentricity's uh, theoretical idea is that for every phenomenon that we examine, we must interrogate that phenomenon with a question, what is the role or the centrality of African people in this particular adventure? So Afrocentricity is theory, but it is also practice. There are people, of course, who are engaged in the practice of uh, applying Afrocentricity to their own lives, uh, trying to center uh, their education of their children, uh, to center their own values uh, in the historical uh, ground of Africa itself. So uh, Afrocentricity uh, is simply us recentering ourselves in the midst of our own uh, historical realities. And the second question that you asked uh, what do I want people to know about black people? Wow, <laughs> that's a very powerful question. I mean, um, number one, uh, we are the mothers and fathers of human civilization. There is no civilization without Africans. Uh, in fact, the uh, origin of the human race uh, is uh, on the African continent. And even if you talk about hominins who existed before Homo sapiens, all hominids uh, uh, trace uh, back to Africa. So uh, you could be talking about uh, Sahelanthropus, Chadensis, uh, then we go back to Chad. Uh, we talk about uh, Ram Ramadus, and we go back to Ethiopia. Uh, or you can talk about the Kenyan origins of hominids as well. Uh, but in terms of Homo sapiens, we know from not just archaeological information, but also from biological information, that all um, uh, human beings who live on the earth today, nearly eight billion human beings, have the DNA that comes from one African woman who lived in East Africa between 200,000 and 300,000 years ago. So the first thing to know about Africa and black people is that before 70,000 years ago, everybody in the world was black. And the reason everybody in the world was black before 70,000 years ago was because we had not migrated uh, out of the continent of Africa. It's the migration out of the continent of Africa that gave the world its differentiation. So uh, that's the first thing. Well, that's a sort of a basic kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking with that history and being the first people on the planet. Why do you think Afrocentricity as a concept hasn't yet penetrated the mainstream black community? Uh, the, one of the real problems that we have is miseducation. And the, we are educated in a system that has, uh, in many senses, made uh, 
the doctrine of race uh, an iconic part of Western civilization, and I call it the racial ladder. This racial ladder has become a major part of what has happened in our uh, society because uh, we, we're sort of stuck into dealing with uh, the construction of Europe of this notion of racial uh, hierarchy where you have uh, white people at the top, sort of Nordic Aryans, and then the so-called Alpines and Mediterraneans uh, and down uh, to the First Nations and the Africans uh, at the bottom. That, that ladder itself, of course, is fake. You're talking about a falsification. It's one of the principal falsifications of human knowledge and one of the key falsifications of, uh, of history. So what we have to do, I think, in order to uh, allow Afrocentricity to penetrate uh, the minds and the communities of the African people is we have, we have to take down as much as we can this racial ladder because the racial ladder makes no sense in the first place. There, there, there were uh, differences between human beings uh, even on the continent of Africa where we originated. Uh, those differences, whether they became after a few hundred or a thousand years, uh, differences in complexion or differences in languages or dress, um, those differences were never equated with differences in terms of intelligence or differences in terms of industry or different in terms of the hierarchy of people in relationship to the supernatural. I mean, we, we, we didn't, Africans saw difference, but we didn't make any claim to difference. It wasn't that you uh, saw um, a person who had a different uh, dress than yours or, uh, or a different uh, complexion than yours, that uh, you, you made a determination that that person was less than you or, or greater than you. That was not an African way. So basically what we are in, we're in a Eurocentric way of viewing reality which makes it very difficult for African people, even the, the, the best of us in the most progressive sense, uh, to get ourselves out of this. Um, this is a box that uh, uh, the scholar Nadav has spoken of as the one that in a way boxes us into race and doesn't allow us to see ourselves as humanity. Because when you see each other, when we see each other as humanity, and we're human beings, then all of these uh, so-called intersectionalities, they fall away. I mean, I don't care. You, you're just a human being as far as I'm concerned. And if I treat you as a human being, as I see you as a human being, if, if I relate to you as a human being, then all those other issues do not matter. One of the things I think about things happening contemporarily. We, right now, in mainstream uh, U.S. society, we have overt white supremacy, a regular and normalized killing of black people in, in large and small cities, uh, a deep anti-black sentiment. Uh, from an Afrocentric perspective, why are we experiencing that? Well, from an Afrocentric point of view, it's a part of the insanity of the nation. And the reason why I say insanity of the nation, because it's not sane, there's no reason for it. Uh, there, there are no reasonable uh, actions that have been taken uh, uh, against white people, for example, in this society by black people that would demand that white people react to black people the way they do. I mean, there, I have no um, uh, way to say it other than it's unreasonable. And if it's unreasonable, it's a part of the insanity that exists. I mean, black people do, you, you know, have black people attack white people for any other reason? The only thing you can think of is a sense of guilt. That's the only reason I think of it. Uh, because of the deep uh, 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 guilt that white people may suffer from 246 years of enslaving African people in bondage and working African people to build the very economic base of the American society, then you may have people who resent that. But uh, there's no, uh, black people are not haters. Uh, there's not, I mean, if you start thinking, for example, in terms of what you call the overt racism, or uh, the notion of white domination, uh, the, even the government of the United States of America cannot find 10, probably not even five, probably not even one black organization that is organized to attack 
fight people violently. There's not one. There's no, they can't even think of it. They, there's no, no, no possibility. The FBI, but there are thousands of white militias who have white racial animosity toward black people. So, well, the answer I told you was insanity. That's the only reason I can think of it. It's unreasonable. But if you ask why the insanity, I think there is uh, what one of my um, colleagues, uh, white colleagues, once said. He said there is a fear of blackness in the American society. But where does this fear come from? It's an irrational fear. You know, if anything, and Tommy Curry has pointed this out, certainly in his works, I mean, if anything, in the American society, black people have been some of the most uh, nonviolent people. In fact, the image of black people as being violent did not occur to long after the Civil War had ended. Before the Civil War, people used to consider black people where they were docile, we were docile, we were lazy, we, uh, we didn't think about anything but, uh, but sex and dancing and joy. We were all free. But then as, the, as black people gained independence and freedom, then there was a fear, and this is what created, of course, the great attacks on black people in the South, where I came from, where you would have this incredible uh, assault on black people who decided to vote. If you decided to vote in my state of Georgia, uh, your house would be burned down. But why? What, what is the reason for this? There's no uh, negativity that black people brought to the situation. It was, we were, we were the victims of it. Black people were the victims of lynching. But black people didn't lynch white people. So, so what I am saying to you about this, and I, I hope I'm touching at least some of the questions that you've raised, is that what happened in the American society uh, cannot be explained except within the context of race. I think that white people have themselves accepted this notion that they created, which is a false notion, this racial ladder notion that white people are better than black people. That's a false notion, but they created it. And so you have to operate on it. So when the police sees a black, young black man if in the police's head, if the police is white, if in his or her head they have this notion of racial classification, if you are black, you are this, 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 and that, then of course the black people, will be, we, we're victims. We become uh, targets, you see? But there, there's no, uh, I mean, there's no, there's no uh, violent uh, reason in the sense that black people are not attacking white people. I mean, you just, you just, you're just jogging down the road but you're black. And black, of course, considered less by the racial ladder. So the racial ladder itself, to me, the racial uh, ideology, the, the notion, we, you know, sometimes we say race is a social construct, but it's also, as Dove also mentions, it's a cultural construct. And I think that when you say it's a cultural construct, what you're saying is that it is baked into the system. There is a, so that if you at a university, it's baked into the system, because the system is racist, it's baked into the system that black studies should not get as much money as white studies. It's just baked in the system. You, you, it, the system is a racial ladder, you see? Black people should not be promoted for the same production as white people are pr promoted for, at the same level. It should not happen, because the racial ladder says that you are less than. And when you, of course, are a black person, and you defy that, then of course you become militant. <laughs> Something's wrong with you. You, you don't, you're, not, you're not on that ladder. You are not only that, you are superior to the white people in terms of the way they estimate what's superior and what is inferior, you see? So that, that creates insanity, that, that's the problem. It is not a problem of blackness. Blackness is, is natural. And whiteness, the way white people are, is uh, they have of course evolved uh, from uh, Africans, uh, just like the uh, Asians have evolved from Africans. Uh, um, the First Nations people have evolved from Africans. We're all Africans. Mm -hmm. We're all Africans, but we have different historical experiences. And the historical experiences of people create these differences and I think create our problems. Okay, okay. So, so with all this, and, and if I'm looking at, uh, particularly in our young people in our communities and, 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 and they're listening and wondering, well, how is Afrocentricity, how is this kind of thinking 
going to address my daily problems with race and with everything else that I face, why should I, why would I want to adopt an Afrocentric perspective? Well, if, for example, you're asking yourself the question, uh, what, what is the concept of beauty? If you are an African person, you're asking that uh, question, it would seem to me that you would uh, interrogate your own history first. Mm -hmm. But if you live in a, uh, a society with this notion of this racial ladder, then you always see yourself in a negative light. So Afrocentricity allows you to see yourself as a subject, not as an object, not as a victim, but as a subject who can create and develop and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and create a, an environment that will allow you to operate in a very positive light in the world. And I think that uh, any African person uh, who lives uh, in Africa or in America or in Europe or in, in anywhere in the Americas or Caribbean, I think the African person must first of all uh, see whether or not we have in our own imaginations uh, this notion of the uh, hierarchy uh, of races and uh, whether or not we have adopted uh, uh, the ladder, the racial ladder that white people have developed. And I think that we have to a large degree. That's why black people, um, uh, I think, uh, in a, to a large degree, I think uh, black people who, uh, when they, when they, uh, they want to reflect on religion, they think of a white Jesus. Well, why do they think of a white Jesus? They're black. So what is that about? That's about the racial ladder. That's about that whole notion that has been developed by Europe to put Europe in a position of uh, uh, patriarchy and hierarchy at the top levels, you see? So uh, that's, that's the fundamental reaction of a black person whose mind has been captured by this racial ladder. That how to get out of the racial ladder is it, through Afrocentricity. You see, because Afrocentricity allows you not to think of uh, uh, Europe as the highest civilization, which it is not, but which Europe believes and which Europe has uh, aggressively imposed on the rest of the world. So there are many people around the world who believe that European civilization is the, is, is the beginning of civilization is Europe. Greece, Rome, the beginning of civilization. When these were young civilizations to African civilization, they're not as old as Nubia or Egypt. They, they, they're not as profound in the history of the world. That really, rather than to talk about Homer, for example, uh, as being someone who started uh, this discussion of myth, and I, well, the, the first thing a child should learn in any school, and this has nothing to do with race, they should learn history correctly, that the person who built the first pyramid M Hotel is the most important person in human history. That's the first thing they should learn. If a child goes to elementary school, they should learn about M Hotel. But I guarantee you that most Americans, black or white or Asian or Latinx, do not know the name of M Hotel. Well, that's insane. That's part of the insanity. Why, why is that? Why is that? M Hotel lived 2,200 years before Homer. And yet we do not know Imhotep's name, and he built the first of the Great Pyramids, a black man. Why is it? The reason we don't know because he's black, he's African. So it seems like, uh, again, you look at the racial ladder, blacks are at the bottom. So how do you explain Imhotep, the builder of the first pyramid? So that is the that's a fundamental problem, you see, that we have to wrestle with, and that's why I call it the falsification, the latter itself. We, we say race biologically does not exist because we, number one, all come from Africa. We, our DNA goes all the way back to Africa. Whether you're a Chinese or a French, your, your, your DNA goes back to Africa, right? So, so, so biologically, the notion of race is, we, we are 99.9% the same. So, Obviously, then, we got a problem, and that problem is the construction of this uh, ladder that has been created, and we forgot to bring it down. Wow. Uh, you mentioned 
uh, Imhotep and Egyptian and Greece civilizations and things of that nature. And one of the aspects of Afrocentricity is its attempt to correct a historical record. However, there has been some backlash against uh, Afrocentric claims. I wanted to ask you to take a look at a brief clip of Mary Lefkowitz speaking on Afrocentrism and philosophy and get your response. What is Afrocentrism? Well, it's a lot of things. Um, the part that I was concerned about was the claim that was made by certain authors that Greek philosophy was stolen from Egypt. And I thought, well, first of all, you can't steal ideas. Um, but secondly, uh, you can't really, well, it wasn't, that's all. There's just no evidence. And I, but then I, I had to find out why people made that claim because it, you know, it, it, it didn't come from nowhere. So that got me on a really interesting search. Right, but it is true that the Greeks did look to the Egyptians every once in a while, right? I mean, Plato talks sure. about myths and all that coming from the Egyptians and so on, right? Absolutely. No, they they learned a lot from Egypt, and they were actually had a colon, colonies in Egypt. They were they were trading colonies. You know, they they were kept pretty separate, but they were kind of there. So they they were in a position to learn something about Egypt. And Herodotus, the great historian, went to went to Egypt, and they respected Egypt greatly. Dr. Asante, your response to Mary Lefkowitz's claim that Greek philosophy was not stolen from Egypt. Well, uh, thank you very much for that question, too. Uh, I debated uh, Mary Lefkowitz uh, three times, the last time at the Smithsonian. Uh, let me just say that uh, in, in, in this particular clip, I heard something that was very strange, where she said that ideas cannot be stolen. Well then we shouldn't even have laws against or rules against uh, plagiarism. I mean, the whole idea is that you can steal ideas. And uh, there were many ideas that were taken from uh, Kemet, from Egypt, uh, by uh, Greek writers uh, and Greek authors uh, that w were not acknowledged in some cases as being Egyptian. And I don't, I don't know what you can call that except stolen. Uh, however, there were some uh, Greeks who recognized that these were stolen ideas, and Herodotus, she mentioned the name of Herodotus, Herodotus writes about this in his book, Histories, uh, particularly in book two, which is, if you get a ch chance, read book two, and you will find that he says the names of the Greek gods came from, from Egypt, from Africa. He, 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 he talks about all of the ideas, all concepts, many of them that came uh, to Greeks uh, from Egypt. But not only that, but she says that philosophy uh, cannot be attributed to, to uh, Egypt or to Africa. Well, that's not true either, because the first Greek philosopher was a man by the name of Thales. And Thales, uh, actually, who lived around 600 BC, Thales, uh, this Greek uh, uh, writer and author, studied in Egypt. And not only did he study in Egypt, but he recommended to a young man by the name of Pythagoras that uh, Pythagoras, if you want to learn about philosophy, you too must go to Egypt. And what did Pythagoras do? He went and spent more than 20 years in Egypt studying with the priests at the temples. And he didn't even create his theorem until he left Africa. So this is, this is almost, this is how you get people into sort of this unreal situation. I mean, attribute to Africa what Africa has done. Don't try to take away from Africa. The earliest philosopher we know of is the man by the name of Imhotep. The second one is Patahotep. But we also know there were other philosophers. Dwarf, Mary Kari, uh, Amenemhat, Amenemope, um, Amenhotep, the son of Hapu. Akhenaten himself was considered a philosopher. All these philosophers live seven or 800 years before the first Greek philosopher. So you can't claim that uh, philosophy somehow grew up in Greece, it didn't. And they know that, the people, the people like Mary Lefkowitz knew that. In fact, she said to me once at the debate in the Smithsonian when we had that debate, she said to me, Malefi, she got up, she was the first speaker. She got up and said, Malefi, everybody knows that, you know, 
uh, the ancient Egyptians were black. And um, I, 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 because we had had two debates before that in which she had denied it. But now she wanted to try to take the, cut my feet off before I got up. I said, Mary, I wish you had known that before we had the last two debates because you wouldn't be making this claim now. But, but, but the argument is that they could not understand how Africa could produce the world's first architectural constructions that just really wiped out to everybody. If you see the pyramids, you see the temples, you see the tombs, and you ask yourself the question, how could this be in Africa? It's only in the African continent. It's not in the European continent. Look at this. The Parthenon that they point to in Greece comes around 5th century BC. The pyramids, we, they started around 2700 BC, almost 2,200 years before the Parthenon. So we don't uh, have a, there shouldn't be a debate about that. There's no question about that. And I think Mary Lefkowitz probably gave a lot of hope to the people who had created the European notion of racial hierarchy because uh, her book was called uh, Not Out of Africa. Well, of course, we know now uh, not only is uh, philosophy out of Africa, but uh, um, human civilization is out of Africa. And uh, not only human civilization, but human, human beings, homo sapiens, are out of Africa. Can you help us better understand the relationship between miseducation, the racial hierarchy, and the ways that black children understand who they are? Yeah, I think those are interrelated terms. I thank you very much for that question. I think they're inter interrelated in a, in a significant way. Uh, at, at the core of that problem, uh, again, it, it goes back to this notion that uh, somehow Africa is not a part of human history. Mm -hmm. And this was the old notion that was given by maybe the greatest Euro European intellectual of all times, with the exception perhaps of Plato, whose name was Hegel, and he argued that Africa was no part of human history. And so that is part of what the curriculum, the K through 12 curriculum has embraced, this notion that uh, if Africa exists, it only exists in relationship to Europe. Uh, that is the conquest of the British, uh, the conquest of the French, the Portuguese, the Spaniards. So then we can talk about Africa, but we can't talk about Africa of its own because it doesn't exist. It is totally outside of this notion of human history. So uh, that, of course, is a false notion as well. And so uh, the, and, uh, in kindergarten or first grade or second grade, when the little African uh, child uh, raises questions about uh, himself or herself, and they're wanting to know something about history, the teacher doesn't know because the teacher hasn't been educated in the university about Africa either. So the teacher doesn't know. In fact, if the child comes from a family that is able to give that child some information about history and about Africa, uh, then the child is looked at as being an agitator for even raising that question in an elementary class. The, the, the teacher says, wait a minute, where do you get that information from, you see? So it is a, it is a, it is a, a catch uh, 22 type of situation that you are in this box, but how do you break out of this box so that you now are able to see uh, human history for what it is and, and uh, for all of the diversity that exists in human history to also see that the identity of the African child rests upon uh, a false notions that have been given by a bad educational system. I mean, if you, if you were taught, I mean, say, say for example, you uh, were uh, uh, a person who happened to have been uh, born in China, but you are of, uh, of, of, of Portuguese background, if you've been born in China, and you went to only Chinese schools, and you learn only Chinese concepts and ideas, and you learn nothing about the Portuguese ideas. Uh, ultimately, at some point, you will almost see yourself through the same eyes as a Chinese person. You, you wouldn't see yourself as a Portuguese because you had no, there's no information, no knowledge. You, you would probably sit in class as a child and wonder, well, what about my history? 
What about the people who came from Portugal? No information. You this totally lost. Lost, and that is basically what happened uh, to the majority of African American children in this society. And it happens not just in this society; in Europe, it happens. It happens in South America. It happens in Canada. It happens in Africa itself, where people are educated on the colonial basis, where the uh, colonies, uh, whether they are uh, from France or Britain or whatever, uh, Belgium. Uh, they have left their educational systems intact on the African continent and the African teachers carry out these philosophies and these concepts as if they are the Europeans who, who, who are doing the, the teaching, you see. So the children are still lost. So the only way you can do that is to break what I call the Pan-European Academy. You got to break that academy up. And you, you at least, if you, if you don't break that academy, then you can't break the colonial mentality. The, the, the mental uh, destruction that is happening to black minds or that's happening to white minds because white people themselves, that's part of the, what I call the insanity. They don't know why they hate black people, but they just hate them. Mm -hmm. So why is that? That's the educational system. The edu you, can, you should not be able to go to school from kindergarten to 12th grade and still come out of school as a racist. How can that happen? If you are reasonable and you have reasonable instruction and, 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 and an understanding of the world, when you finish education, you should come out of that experience with a whole different way of looking at reality and human beings. So our children are victims of the curriculum and uh, as many of uh, our greatest thinkers and writers have always said, uh, have become uh, not only uh, victims, but we become purveyors of the same knowledge and the same information. And you mentioned Pan-European Academy. Can you help us understand what, what is the Pan-European Academy? Well, I, I go back to Carter Woodson, uh, to Du Bois, uh, as well to John Henry Clark, uh, Asa Hilliard, Frere Rivers, um, Many, many thinkers about this, Ama Mazama even, on this as an Afrocentric paradigm. The, 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 what the Pan and Chen Weizu, who gave really the term, uh, what, what this refers to is that wherever you are in the world where Europe has been, there is a particular set of facts that Europe provides to the rest of the world. So if you live in Australia, the set of facts that you get in Australia are basically the same set of facts that you get in Nigeria or that you get in Britain or you get wherever in France, for example. I just give you just as a hint. Uh, who is the greatest writer who ever lived? Shakespeare. Oh, wait a minute. As I said to a, a person when they say, how many African writers do you know? I don't know any come up with a statement that Shakespeare is the greatest writer. You can only do that because it's part of the Pan-European Academy. Mm -hmm. There are a certain group of stars that you have to know and that you have to say, yes, this is true. So again, so whether you're black or Chinese or Aboriginal uh, Australian, this is a set of facts that the Pan-European Academy gives you. And you have to figure out how you want to deal with this academy, you see? And not only does it, ha it, have, uh, does it have, have, uh, have facts uh, like that, but it also has uh, concepts and ideas. So that you get the idea that, uh, for example, that socialism uh, is something that came from Europeans. You, you don't have a, you use it, but Marx may have given us this notion of socialism. Wait a minute. Africans were the first who came up with the concept of socialism. You see what I mean? So what about an Afrocentric socialism? It doesn't have to be a Marxist socialism, you see? I just learned that today, you know? Many things like that. You gotta, you gotta be able to think, and that's how you think when you start thinking. You say, oh, wow, I see this. So my, my reaction is to, um, to use an expression that the old H. Rob Brown used to say, question everything. If the European says it, question it. 
Because otherwise you'll be wrong. You, you don't know what, if, if they say that, look, Plato is the first philosopher. You have to say, oh, now let me, quite, let me ask, whether not, were there any Chinese philosophers before? Were there any Persian philosophers before? Were there any Ethiopian philosophers? You've you got to raise the question. You cannot accept the European Academy as going to be something that will tell us the truth. Because the idea is about how to keep us at a level that is considered inferior. Is it safe to say that the things that many of our young people are learning in college classrooms, that they should question all of that information as being tainted with uh, European or Eurocentricity? Uh, should they question all of their knowledge, even if it's in the STEM fields, regardless of what they're learning? I, I think that's a, good, that's a good question. No, too, because I think that, uh, no, it's not just uh, social sciences or social studies. No, you have to question also uh, things that are in uh, technology and the things that are, uh, that, that are given to us that come from what we consider to be more technical or scientific fields. Uh, but, but I think that they are probably less problematic than the social studies and social sciences area. And the reason for that is because those are facts that we can check. Those people who say, well, okay, we know, yes, it's true that Eurocentricity is bad and that it's not true that everything has its start in Europe, but the response shouldn't be that we're gonna turn around and now say everything came from Africa. And what we wanna do now, instead of doing that, is let's just start over as one human family now. Mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm. now let's be human family, mm -hmm. as opposed to you running off with this whole African thing. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you respond to that? Well, I think, that's, I think there's some logic in that. I mean, I don't, uh, I, 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 Afrocentricity is not about uh, making the world, uh, in terms of everything African, that, that should never be in the Afrocentrist mind. The Afrocentrist mind, uh, you remember, uh, one of the things I have always said is that uh, Afrocentricity is about us uh, seeing all uh, phenomena uh, from the standpoint of African people as being subjects in, our, in the realities that we have. It, but it's not that, we, that all knowledge came out of Africa. That's not true. That cannot be argued. Uh, but what can be argued is that the earliest knowledge of human civilization was African. And that uh, the first people to, uh, to look at the stars and, uh, uh, and give them names were Africans. The, the first people to cross a river or a stream were Africans. They had to be because Homo sapiens spent about two-thirds of the life of Homo sapiens in Africa. We, we didn't, human beings didn't, Homo sapiens didn't leave Africa to 70,000 years ago. So, so where, were, where were these human beings? They were all on the continent of Africa. So that's where we worked out all these things, what was edible and what was not. Uh, what is the best way to capture a lion? You know, I mean, what, whatever, all that stuff was worked out in Africa. And so those skills we bring with us, whether we migrate from East Africa to Southern Africa, because we, we, we migrated throughout Africa. Sometimes people think that all Homo sapiens left Africa, but that's not true. Uh, Homo sapiens remained in Africa, but some went to other parts of the world. And by migrating to other parts of the world, uh, Homo sapiens brought the knowledge that they had acquired in Africa with them, whether they went to Europe or Arabia or India, wherever they went, you see, or Australia, uh, which is one of the furthest away, away that uh, Africans went, was to Australia. So this is, that's the, the reality of the fact. So I would think that we wouldn't want to uh, say that there's a difference, and I, I should point this out, between what we call Afrocentricity and what, what I see as Eurocentricity. Eurocentricity is the idea of um, imposing a particular European or particular uh, cultural uh, expression, whether that involves the patriarchy or hierarchy with it, onto the world as if uh, it is universal. In other words, taking the European experience, the particular experience of Europe, and saying Europe's philosophy, Europe's art, Europe's dance, 
All of this is universal. The, the, when you say that and you make, put that on the world, that's a problem. I don't think any Afrocentrist is saying that. No Afrocentrist that I know of is saying, look, take the, the African way and put it and say it encompasses everything, it is universal. No, I'm not saying that. I say that the origin of civilization and the origin of humanity, that's universal. But in terms of how history um, and uh, politics and economics, how these things have worked out over the lives of people, uh, create, in, in many ways, their own autobiographies. So and that's fine, and we can deal with that. And we can wrestle with these different autobiographies of human, human beings. But we cannot necessarily uh, ever make a, 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 the same mistake that Europe made, to take the idea of Europe and to impose it on everybody else, as if when you say, um, when you say ballet, you say that's classical dance. But when you talk about African dance, say from the royal court of the Asantes, uh, you call that dance folk dance. Mm -hmm. Why is mine folk and yours is classical? What, 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 who created that? It's the hierarchy created that. The European, no, Africa doesn't do that. That's not, and the Afrocentrist doesn't do that. Dr. Sante, I want to ask you to take a look at a brief clip. You brought up Pan-Africanism, mm -hmm. and uh, just want to get your reaction to this. Nobody did that. Ain't nobody been around here judging her blackness. What we have judged is her lineage and her attachment to American D.O. descendants of slaves. She has a Jamaican parent and an Indian parent, and neither of those parents is an is a American D.O.S., descendant of chattel slavery in this country. Not everywhere slavery. We know that was slavery in other parts of the world. But if you're in the Caribbean or one of those places, if you're in Haiti, then your, your, your issue, as we've said here many a times, is with the French. And if you ever get reparations from the French, I will clap, I will be happy, I will throw you a party, I will buy you a drink, baby, but I will not try to take your money. I will not try to eat that fruit because I don't have no bones buried in Haiti. My bones is buried in here. I celebrate you. I will help you, but I understand that that is yours, and I think you understand that too. So the real issue is, just like I'm not Jamaican, just like I'm not Haitian, just like I'm not Eritrean, you are not American DOS. You, are not in the, you do not have parents and grandparents who grew up on sharecropper farms who can trace their stuff black to slavery. You do not have that. So what that means is that you are not a part of this tribe. That don't mean you are not black. It means you are not a part of this tribe. As I'm sure you know, there are some groups that are warning against Pan-Africanism. You mentioned Pan-Africanism. Uh, for example, the ADOS movement, ADOS, which stands for American Descendants of Slavery, encouraging black people to close in the ranks and either squash Pan-Africanism or put it on a major delay because some groups, such as black people from the Caribbean or from Africa and things of that nature, harbor anti-black sentiment or because they mess up black Americans' reparations claims, these kinds of things. So the first thing I wanted to do is ask you, what is Pan-Africanism and its relationship to Afrocentricity? And how do you respond to the ADOS movement and some of its concerns? Pan-Africanism is, uh, is a very old, in fact, is probably one of the most significant uh, uh, political and intellectual uh, movements in the African world. Uh, and the, it's a movement toward the unity of African people. Uh, and this unity is based fundamentally uh, on uh, similar uh, cultural experiences, uh, resistance to oppression, and also the belief that in order for African people uh, to advance in any society, we must have a, a fundamental uh, relationship to our ancestors. So it's an it's a ancestral political uh, connection that is based fundamentally on African people advancing economically, politically, socially, and culturally uh, in a world that is made up of uh, nearly uh, two or three billion African people. And in terms of its relationship to Afrocentricity, uh, Afrocentrists have always said that uh, to, to give Pan-Africanism its energy, uh, it has to be based on an Afrocentric uh, idea. That is, that uh, African people must first of all uh, have a consciousness of Africa itself, and they must see themselves as subjects who are capable and able 
of uh, actually uh, determining their own future. So, so having uh, an Afrocentric uh, theoretical or philosophical direction will spur an, uh, a Pan-African movement. If you don't have an Afrocentric orientation, then Pan-Africanism simply becomes, to me, uh, a, um, a propaganda call, a call uh, but uh, certainly something without substance. To give it substance, you, you must have an Afrocentric theory. And, and then there were some concerns, ADOS. The ADOF movement I consider a very tangent. Uh, uh, it's a tangent. Uh, there are many uh, political tangents uh, in the African world. Uh, this is one, and uh, in many ways it is quite reactionary. Uh, and it's reactionary because, uh, in effect, uh, the argument that ADOS makes about uh, the American descendants of slavery is the same argument that white people can make in terms of uh, their notion of reparations. Uh, uh, probably uh, more than half of the white people in America now could say, well, you know, I had nothing to do with that, that we are not a part of that, that in fact uh, you asking for reparations uh, by using my tax dollars and my people didn't come here until 1880. Uh, my people didn't come here like uh, Trump's people didn't come here to, uh, to the 1900s. So, I mean, what, what, what does this have to do with anything? No, the, the notion, uh, the two notions here, uh, Pan-Africanism is an international movement and it is not just a, a movement in terms of just solidarity of African people who live in the United States of America, but all of the Americas. Uh, were engaged in the process of the enslavement of Africans. Uh, and whether you're from Jamaica or Haiti or Colombia or Brazil or the United States, uh, as a person of African descent, uh, all, of, all of us uh, were involved in, uh, we, we were victims of that uh, enslavement. And in, in effect, uh, the person who claims that the Jamaican is not an African-American, but the Jamaican has been here for several generations, uh, is making a really false claim because uh, who knows, the same person, she may very well have come from the same village in Nigeria as the Jamaican. You, you may come from the same village in Ghana as a, as a brother or sister in Colombia or as a brother or sister in Brazil because the, slave, the slavers, when they were enslaving African people, got people, and they didn't drop us all off sometimes at the same place. People were dropped in Cuba. The blacks who live in Cuba, uh, who, who, who are to say that they shouldn't have reparations if now they've been living, for, uh, living in the United States? The African-American population is the most quintessential American population. We have people who are, who are African uh, Ethiopians, who, who are African uh, Nigerians, uh, African uh, Jamaicans, African Haitians. Uh, we, we, we have Af we, the African American population uh, in terms of what you're talking about, African descendants of slavery, we all have been uh, victimized from in one way or the other. And I think that uh, the victimage of Africans uh, in the Western world is, is, is common, and there's a solidarity in that. I don't think Pan-Africanism initially had anything to do with that particular uh, uh, issue, but as I raise it, as you raise it now, it seems to me that uh, uh, the idea of ADOS having this uh, particular idea is, uh, is, is quite nativist and uh, very, very much reactionary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, do you think that this is the time when pe people of African descent should be thinking about repatriation, or do you think that uh, maybe we should try some other strategy? Well, 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 well Africans have always, African Americans have always thought about repatriation. In fact, there are thousands of African Americans who live in Africa right now. I mean, Ghana has a whole coastline of uh, uh, <laughs> that's uh, been settled by Africans from the United States. Uh, and Jamaica and South Africa has a, a, a large portion of uh, Johannesburg, parts of Johannesburg settled by African Americans. Uh, and many African Americans who retire take their retirement and go to Africa because it's cheaper. They can live in Africa on their pensions 
at a much cheaper rate than they can live in the United States. So uh, repatriation has always gone on in the African American population. We, we always have had people. Uh, we have not had uh, in mass, uh, but uh, we, we are beginning to get that because as I said, the uh, population between uh, Winnebah and, uh, and Cape Coast uh, in Ghana, uh, there's a strong African American population there. And, um, and, and so, and you of, of course, you always get the, uh, the celebrities who, who uh, you know, the Beyonce's and uh, the, the Rita Marley's who have houses and, and Oprah's who have houses and stuff throughout Africa. But, but, but for the most part, I think that we, uh, we don't know enough sometimes about Africa for p repatriation and hopefully African Americans will begin to uh, see Africa as a place that they have to go to in order to have full consciousness. You have to see it for yourself. Dr. Asante, help us understand the movement. I think that the uh, current movement, which is sparked by uh, Black Lives Matter, is really, again, a response uh, to uh, particular issues that have uh, created within the community, within that black community, uh, incredible anxieties and a uh, great sense that we need to defend ourselves uh, politically and, uh, in fact, uh, uh, economically, uh, culturally, and socially. So uh, this Black Lives Matter movement is just one uh, aspect of the entire historical movement that has existed from the beginning of black uh, 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 resistance in the uh, United States of America. I mean, from very early on, from the 1700s, we were petitioning and fighting and saying, this is wrong, this is not right, and so forth and so on. Uh, however, uh, what is... Uh, what is unique about this movement is that it has uh, also operated within the context of what I've often called the racial field, so that it is responding in a racial way uh, to the hierarchy and patriarchy that exists within the society. In other words, we haven't stepped outside of the American system to say, wait a minute, the whole thing is bad. It's not just police brutality. Police brutality, even if we saw police brutality tomorrow or today, there will rise up something else that we have to deal with. So the question is, do we have a movement that treats every particular uh, uh, instance of white racial animosity toward black people? Or do we have a larger movement uh, based on consciousness of uh, African identity and African visions and dreams and African values and morality uh, that deals with the whole question of the American society being against black people in a systemic way? That, that, that is the, that's the issue for me because I think that, uh, you know, a Black Lives Matter movement, is, I, I support it. But it's, it is, it's a narrow movement. It, it's a very specific movement. And in many ways was, uh, was prompted by the outrages over the uh, police killing of black people. But police have been killing black people for a long time, even before this movement, you see. And when police stop killing black people for just being black, then we're going to have to deal with the fact that the banking system uh, is uh, opposed to giving loans to black people. And, and in understanding that, what is the relationship between your work and the movement? Well, I'm just a, I'm just a part of the movement. I'm not, uh, I, I'm certainly no leader in the movement. I'm, I'm a part of the movement uh, in the sense that I participate to the best of my ability with the skills that I have. Dr. Sante, I wanted to ask you, if, if black people follow the Afrocentric lead, and begin to see ourselves culturally as Africans and adopt Afrocentricity. Where does that put us in the future, 10, 20 years from now? What, what, what does that look like if we actually get 
a mass of people uh, coming on board. It puts us uh, in a wonderful place of being self-determining people, believing uh, ultimately on the principles that are derived from our most uh, ancient uh, uh, ancestors, uh, particularly around concepts of spirituality um, and uh, concepts of culture, ritual, and, uh, and myth that uh, allows people to grow in a uh, humane way and to be humane to other people. Uh, that's one. It allows us to build our own schools if necessary uh, so that we can have options. I mean, it's only if we can, I mean, we do this uh, to have options, to be able to do anything that we want to. It gives us a sense of the freedom which we have always fought for and which we have been the principal definers of freedom in America. Uh, this is why freedom, meaning ultimately uh, uh, those of us who were in bondage have been able to uh, come out of this and to create a whole new world of freedom, uh, uh, unlike anything that has been created. Uh, we have uh, increased and we will increase by virtue of being more Afrocentric the opening of uh, society so that uh, there is a common uh, understanding and appreciation of all cultures and all peoples. Thank you, Dr. Asante, and thank you for being on the movement. Thank you. World-renowned scholar Dr. Malefi Asante, thank you for joining us on The Movement. And to you, the viewer, you can find us on Facebook at The Movement with Kemet and Kofi. And remember to join us next time on The Movement.